slides, whatever, that's fine. This is just kind of a, a bonus. <laughs> no I'm, problem, I'm, Alex. Think, Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I haven't presented enough today. I need to do some more presenting. <laughs> so, uh, so this is kind of, uh, I don't, uh, I don't mind if people are out there, if you want to put your videos on so you can talk to each other, that's fine. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions about this, uh, this, this aspect of it anyway, uh, with your mics on. This is, um, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of piggybacking on this Chemmetrics webinar to give a little uh, piece of information, a little plug to um, some software that I wrote, um, which uh, was designed just to kind of make it easier for some of the research group and the, um, uh, the undergraduates and, and master's students as, as we come through to, uh, to try to get uh, to try to get started with the, the data analysis without having to learn everything about MATLAB. Uh, so, uh, so it's got some kind of simplistic tools in there. Um, it, it, it's not as sophisticated as some other things. It's got some tricks in it. It's got some stuff specific to um, to the techniques that we use. So, uh, so it might be useful. And if it's not. Well, I hope that I haven't uh, ruined your lunch, and, and you could always just eat eat your sandwiches uh, or whatever, and have a have a coffee, um, uh, and have this on in the background, perhaps. So this is um, <clears throat> so just interrupt me if, um, if if as we go, that's fine. So this is a, a toolbox for MATLAB. It's uh, originally I was trying to base it around sort of like two thousand nine release, but it. MATLAB's moved on so much. So at the moment, it's probably compatible with around about 2016. Some of it's compatible with 2014. I'm working with 2019 at the moment, so it's definitely mostly compatible with that. It has some help information in it. I wouldn't say it's very thorough, but when I've written help, but it's you know I've tried to to explain things clearly, um, and uh, and it's open source. It's free to use. It's um, it's uh, under the uh, GPL. Um, a license, so you can use it to, for for anything you like. The only restriction for the GPL license is if you uh, release, uh, if you change it and release it, then you must release your source code with that as well. <clears throat> and it would be interesting to find out who's using it. So just uh, drop me a line, let me know. Um, so this is so this is the location. Um, let me just zoom in a little bit because I think it might be easier to see on different size screens. Is that? Reasonable to, to see. I'm, I'm not, um, so this is um, uh, this is the website. It's it's on Bitbucket. There's a historical reason for that. So it's not on GitHub uh, or, or GitLab. It's on Bitbucket. Um, uh, you you would you wouldn't see this part until you're until you're logged in. Uh, you um, if you want to just download it, that's fine. If you want to modify it, and change it, you'd have to join Bitbucket, but that's free, so it's not too bad. Um, to uh, this is the landing page, uh, which has uh, got a menu down the side. So it's Bitbucket, and here we have the. So we've got a bit of information about the README, which has some help pages. The help pages are part of the wiki. <coughs> so um, so this is it. So we've got information about the installation. So uh, if you want to get, uh, if you want to download it and put it on. So I've got like three different methods um, of installing it. And maybe I should probably create an installer, but uh, that's further off. Um, the best method really is to install Git, which is um, a version control software, and then you can integrate that with MATLAB, and then uh, then you can simply uh, type, once it's installed, you can type, um, let me just get my, uh, you can type chi update, for example, case sensitive of course, MATLAB, <coughs> and it will um, go off to the, uh, off to the web and bring down the most recent version and install it and sort your path out. Uh, so that's, that, that means that if I change something, you can update it. Uh, if you're going to use this and reference it, then um, there are some standard things that you should do really, uh, because you need to say which version you use, because at the moment I don't have like version one, version two, version three, anything like that. It's just a get it out there and get it going. So, um, so you, if you're, you should record or report the version that you used, and to do that, we would, that would be on the on the. Um, I'll put it here. Um, the, at the top, if you want to do a clone and <coughs> or download, <coughs> for example. So if you just went, if you did a Kai update and went to downloads, 
uh, download it. This has a a number at the end, wherever that's gone. Where's my downloads box? So that has a. Uh, Has a it downloads this this number on the end is the um, is the commit number so that's the exact version of every file that's in there so if you quote that number then then we you can go back to that specific version and therefore that's good for um, uh, repeatability in open research so um, so this the source code is uh, it's it's object oriented code it has a bunch of stuff in it. Um, it means that when you're when you're using it, you would um, you use the function type um, use of MATLAB, where you use the the round brackets, and um, and use a dot notation. So it's something dot plot, something dot uh, vector normalized, that sort of thing. So it's based around uh, three uh, three concepts of um, of a spectrum, a collection of spectra, and and a hyperspectral image. And um, and you can move between them. So let's just let's have an example. So as I said it reads a bunch of files. So each each of the file formats it reads has its own reader. So if you wanted to, you could go in there and play with that and um, and steal the code and do things other things with it. That's fine. It's allowed. Um, it's not really stealing. It's sh sharing, which is fine. So we each each different type of file format has its own reader, and then buried in here you've got the actual hard stuff for the actual bit that does the you know the underlying uh, nitty gritty reading the files and such like which you can explore to your heart's content. Um, but wrapped around that is a thing called chi file, and that allows you to open anything. So if I say let's say x is a chi file, uh, semicolon of course because that's what we like to have. That will then uh, I I can put in brackets after that the name of a file specifically. But um, uh, let's go and find some files. I've got some on the drive here. Uh, where are my data? So what should we have? Let's have some infrared data. Uh, what have we got? Um, I don't know. Uh, this is one of my demos. I normally use this as a just a demo file. So uh, so you can't see everything here. At the moment, what we're seeing is the readable files. You can filter that by different file formats uh, or, or, or just you know, moment to show everything. Uh, little things to be careful of. DAT files, actually, you're not going to encounter them. So um, the, the, there's an imaging MASPEC file format as a .dat file, so that, and also the um, you get a .dat for uh, Agilent files as well. So, so, so for Agilent files, I specify DMT files. So if we go to the DMT file, oh, and open that. So this is an image. So we didn't tell it that it was an Agilent file. We didn't tell it that it was. Um, that it was an image and not a spectrum. It just said, "Go and open that. Get on with it." And um, and then we can we can show that, which of course is coming up in a different window. So that is the uh, the total signal image of um, of that piece of uh, tissue or whatever it is, like prostate tissue, I guess. So that's an infrared. So we didn't tell it anything. It just worked out. And um, in our workspace, we've got a variable for that, which is um, of type chi. It's a chi toolbox for, for, for Center for Hyperspectral Imaging, which doesn't exist because I haven't created it yet. But you know, good plan, plan ahead. So this is a, an infrared image. So we have the concept of images, for example. Uh, so concept image, and there are various things you can do with an image. You can denoise an image, take first derivative of it to the key means analysis of it or whatever. And then there are infrared images, for example, which uh, where you get um, Additional parameters. The infrared image itself doesn't look like it has anything, but that's because it's developing um, uh, infrared character. So it, it it has other things. So you can do, for example, uh, armies um, scatter correction. Uh, if you don't like that, then you can use uh, Akim Kohler's MEEMSE correction, which is arguably better, and you can do other things, uh, you know, which which you would want for infrared spectra, which wouldn't mean something, wouldn't mean anything to a Raman spectrum, for example. Um, uh, you, you can remove remove diamond contribution from an ATR, a diamond ATR crystal. Oh, it just chops a piece of the spectrum out. But I don't have to remember the wave number limits. It's just chop it out. So say we wanted to. Uh, so let's do, do K-means of that. So. Um, 
So we would say just say xk means, and as um, as Baden said, we need to tell us how many classes. So let's say we just have three classes, three components, and uh, um, let's do that. There's no semicolon this time. So we don't need it. So that's doing k means clustering on that image. <coughs> and there's the hour gone. Well, we are. That was nice, wasn't it? Um, so we have other things, for example, so you can remove wax again, that just chops out a region, um, so it's not necessarily very good. Uh, infrared, of course, you might want to go from uh, transmittance to absorbance. There we go, it's a k-means image. And uh, and then we've got, and that's produced a cluster outcome because it's it's a result of a clustering experiment, and that has some parameters. So if we just see what these parameters were, so the, the, the original image has, it's, this is object-oriented programming, so the variable has a bunch of stuff captured inside it. So you maybe have used uh, structs where you have um, uh, the, the variable has a number of parameters, named parameters inside it. So this is kind of like structs with, um, you know, on steroids. It's, you know, and it's a object on programming is quite a standard across programming uh, fields. So it has parameters. So we can ask it things. So for example, we can ask our image, what are the uh, X pixels? Uh, or just tab completion. So, 56 pixels. Uh, I don't know how many channels have we got? Um, um, that gives us. That tells us how many channels. We so we can just ask it for information. Um, it's a. It's an infrared spectrum. It knew it was an infrared spectrum when it read the file. We didn't tell it. It worked it out, uh, and therefore we have a variable called wave numbers. And that makes it easier to plot things. So, say we want to uh, to, to to plot uh, plot the spectrum. Well, we have, we have an option for a total spectrum, so we just ask it. Total spectrum, please. In the wrong window. There we go. There's your total spectrum. Oh, there's there's some scattering. Okay, let's let's do some scatter correction. So. Uh, now I'm not going to do armies on the scatter correct of the image because this is how many pixels? None pixels. 65,000 pixels, which is um, I, I can do one armies iteration. Let's see. Uh, I don't want to do two because it's going to take forever. This is sensible defaults. So. Um, so if I just say do armies, it does one iteration with the default armies parameters. You can specify the parameters if you want, and that's um, that's another option. That there are, you can specify the iterations and all the all the things you can specify for armies, in the same way that you can specify all of those things for um, uh, for the MEE MSC also. And it, and uh, and we have some. What I've tried to do is put in sensible defaults. So for example. Um, you can denoise a spectrum, well, you can't denoise a spectrum. You can denoise a spectral collection. It does principal components analysis denoising, which uh, which was mentioned this morning. It's the SVD type approach. Um, you can't do that on a single spectrum because you can't do principal components analysis on a single spectrum. But you can do it on an image. And for that, uh, the, the, the default is to um, to discard 30% of the, was it? No, I think it retains 30% of the variable, uh, principal components. But you can specify the number. Um, some things you have to specify something. So if you do first derivative, then it requires you to specify the window size. At the moment, I'm only doing um, fourth order polynomial, but I, I think I might add that just as an extra feature. So um, you can specify your polynomial and your and your window size, but it does a window. So um, so oh, that, that means so one of the things that you need to remember if you're going to use this is to clone things, make, make a copy of something when you clone it. This is a problem with MATLAB. MATLAB does something. So if, I, if I'm in MATLAB and I say, um, uh, A equals 4, I'm assuming that you can see this. A equals 4, uh, B equals um, 3. Um, so C equals, uh, well, let's just say C equals equals a. So c is 4 because a was 4. If I now change a c, c is the same. It hasn't changed. That's because it's it's created in another variable that are not connected. 
if you want to do object oriented programming, you use you use handle classes and therefore they're all connected, which means things are the same. So if I if I take my um, uh, let's create let's let's save a spectrum. Um, total eye and uh, total eye spectrum. There's my total eye and spectrum over here in a different window. Come over here. If I if I um, I've stored that. So what happens is it calculated the total eye and spectrum and put the answer into the variable s, which has which is a spectrum class over here. And um, an S has some parameters. It, it doesn't have pixels because only images have pixels. So it has different parameters. Some are the same, wave numbers, data. Some are, are, are different. Reverse X is because we want to plot infrared spectra from high wave number to low wave number. Um, so therefore, it's true. We want to flip the X axis. Um, so, so I've now created a copy of, of uh, of s. So if I say um, another s is s, what that's done is it's made it hasn't it's made a link to it. It hasn't it hasn't created a new variable. It's just created a connection to it, and that's a, that's a MATLAB thing. I can't get around that. Uh, which means that if I do something like s um, s do our mes on us our me our mes on s did a single iteration. So S has now uh, has now been scatter corrected. Another, others, sorry, has also magically been scatter corrected because they were one was pointing to the other, and we often don't want that because um, it's going to uh, it, we we want to create we we want to do some manipulation of the data, but we don't want it to change all of the history at the same time. So to do that, what you would say is you would say an, an, uh, oh, right, uh, clone is s dot clone. What that's done now is it's made a duplicate of it, not a link. It, there are two separate things that hold the same information now, which means that you can treat each of them independently. So anything that comes up with these little cubes over here that are chi anything, pretty much, if you want to make a copy of it, use the clone function, and it will handle that for you. Right, so we just saw uh, our mes. So let's um, let's let's do something um, related to that. Ah, the other thing is here. I said s dot mes. What that meant was it did the armies correction on s itself and changed its internal values. So now s has been scatter corrected. If I didn't want to do that. I could have done so. Uh, let me get let me get something else. Uh, new one is um, let's let's do a spe instead of doing the total spectrum. Let's do a spectrum at. So let's do uh, x was our image dot spectrum at, um, and it's an image. So we need two parameters. Uh, let's say hundred by hundred. So that's that's the spectrum at those coordinates. Wherever they were in the, in the image, and you see, we've got a little. We still got some scattering. We've got a little ripple of noise on that. <coughs> um, uh, um, so we can now correct. Let's correct that. <coughs> new one, new one. Uh, let's do any AMSC instead, and we'll just take the defaults for that. So that's the original hasn't changed. We, what we've done is we've asked it because we want to make, we've told somewhere we want to put the answer. We've asked it to make a clone of itself and then correct the clone. And there is the MEEMSC scatter corrected um, uh, spectrum. And we can scatter correct the whole image. And uh, actually, MEE. MEEMSC will correct a 65,000 spectrum image relatively quickly. If you ask our MEES to do that on more than one iteration, it's going to take all weekend. Uh, but the MEEMSC, Akim Kohler's um, uh, team's uh, code is uh, does it in different ways faster. Um, so I would recommend uh, using that. That's one thing. Uh, 
Okay, so that's a that's a, a spectrum and image uh, infrared. Uh, let's let's try Raman image. How about that? Or Raman Raman, Raman something. Let's open a file. So we're in Kai file. Let's go and find some Raman data. Where's the Raman data? Uh, uh, some Raman data. Uh, some Jaws. What's this? Okay, so this is um, this is a Renishaw file. The original Renishaw file. Oh, that's a bit noisy, isn't it? Oh, maybe that's not a great one to uh, to work with. Let's try a different one. Try. I haven't actually planned this um, uh, this little this little demo workshop thing, <laughs> as, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I some of cat's data. Uh, what here? What's that? Oh, okay. So these are images, I think. So these are WDF um, Renishaw files. There's, oh. There's a Renishaw file, Renishaw Raman image, um, and we can uh, we can extract a pixel from that. Um, I guess there is a, a we have a, I have a thing called uh, click and something or other. Click on. There we go. Click on uses the last image, so um, we have to be a little bit careful. I mean, it's not very sophisticated. So this is the the um, across the bottom here. This is the total spectrum of the of the Raman data. Notice that the Raman it's automatically labeled as with Raman shift and intensity because that's what was in the files. So we knew it read that, and it's plotting from low to high shift, whereas the uh, the infrared one plotted uh, high to low wave number uh, because it's that's what you kind of often want to do with um, Raman or infrared data. Uh, so here, this is the total. So we can uh, we'll, let's have a look at that pixel there. So that's the spectrum of that pixel. There's, there's a bright pixel there. Uh, this is live cell data um, of, of Cat Hollywood's um, Cat, uh, the Thames working for Roy Goodacre. And, um, and one of the problems was that the pot, it took a while to acquire the data and the cell would move. <laughs> so so there's, a, there's a way, a quick and dirty way of, of getting that. And then let's see, we're interested in this peak of the fuel alanine or something. Um, that should, so this is the image of that uh, wave number. Uh, Raman shift, sorry. Um, and, and it report it's reporting. We've got this nasty crosshairs because MATLAB doesn't refresh fast enough for a nice flowing video rate. Uh, we need to press any key to get out of that, otherwise we can't get back to MATLAB. So let's get, let's get back. Uh, well, it's nothing perfect, is it? Get warning. That's like. So we got some Raman data. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's do um, we do, we just seen what the spectra look like. So let's do a baseline correction for that. So our Raman um, Raman image and a Raman spectrum would have has uh, has some other properties to it. If you wanted some help uh, on on all of these uh, these things, we have a um, a little link here. This is MATLAB put this in. So this takes you a link to the help information. Wherever that's going to turn up on my screen, there's the help information. So this is the help for a Kai IO spectrum. So it tells you how to make one. If you don't want to go from a file name, you've gone out to build one from scratch for your file format, for example. And uh, and then it has some uh, properties, and then it has various things. So these are all things you can do with the spectrum. Uh, these are things you can do with an infrared spectrum. So for example, you can do scatter correction, me emsc, which you've just seen on a uh, on a um, on an infrared spectrum, we can remove the CO region from a from a spectrum. If we wanted to go, if we had a, a our Raman image, where has that gone? There we go. We've got help on the Raman image. We get different properties because there are some things that are important to Raman data that they can't do with infrared data, and different methods. So one of the things you can do somewhere in here. Somewhere, I can't remember where it is. Ah, oh, baseline, there we go. Is you can do baseline correction. Um, and uh, and that is in Raman character somewhere and baseline 
uh, do the model of the baseline, and it doesn't have any help. So remind me to write that when I next when I next see you. And um, and it has uh, so it's it's of a type of baseline. So it names a baseline. So I have a function which which can do baseline. I haven't used this for ages. So goodness knows what we're going to get. Um, so it's called RAM, I think that was it. Dot um, model, was it? Mm. Oh, typical. What's it called? Baseline. Oh, yeah. Baseline. And we want to do something with that. We want to model the baseline. So let's model the baseline. He says, and this is great, a GUI in another window. Okay, so here's a GUI. So this is, uh, at the top here, the blue line is the um, uh, the average spectrum uh, across all of the image. The, uh, the orange line is a fit to that, to the baseline fit. So this is taken from, um, this is an asymmetric least squares baseline removal. Uh, this is the removal baseline removal that Roy Godecker uses, and I uh, I took the uh, the principle from it from his Roy Godecker's toolbox. Um, you can access that on Roy's website, which there was a link to that in the um, on one of the slides towards the beginning. Um, and it's uh, biospec.net/resources. Uh, that's Roy's MATLAB code, and I've taken some of Roy's MATLAB code and repurposed it because it's open source. That's what open source is for. <laughs> And what that what this what it does uh, is this is taken from a chromatography uh, approach. What you do is you smooth it, massively smooth the data, gets wipes out all the peaks. You fit a curve to that, uh, which is the baseline, and then you subtract that curve from your raw data or your pre-processed data, your original data, and uh, and that's got rid of the back baseline. So it comes with a few parameters. One is related to um, the amount of smoothing. Uh, one is related to the amount of asymmetry in the curve, and I can't remember what the other one is, but it's all documented. Um, this, the help information for this baseline modeling has uh, information about the, the, the literature reference for this work. So um, we can do something over here, and then we will just update that. Oh, look, it's getting better. So it's not automatic. <coughs> Let's, uh, let's jump up a little bit. Oh, let's jump up a lot. Now we get there. Oh, let's see symmetry. Maybe I need to do more of this. No, go the other way. Uh, let's just say that's as good as we're going to get. And what we've got at the bottom is the removal of this spectrum, of, of this baseline fit. From the average, so this is the average spectrum is the removal from the average spectrum. So this is the, the correct bit. And now we can subtract that. And what that will do, it will now subtract that uh, model from all of the spectra in the image. So our baseline, um, and of course, what I did is I didn't make a copy, so it doesn't, I can't show you the original again. So we've now got a, a Weaker signal because we've removed all the baseline contribution to that, and um, and now let's do our click on again. Just because you can, and it makes it convenient for this. And now we can see that our baseline is uh, is much much flatter, um, and, uh, and that's our average. And now we go to each of these, so they've all now had the same baseline removed. So that's a, a quick way of removing your baselines. It's probably in your Raman analysis software anyway, but hey, I don't have Raman analysis software, so I just wrote it. Okay. What else were things that you might want to know? So file format, so we can read all these different file formats. Um, we can do images, so we can do k-means of an image. So there's, that was a Raman image, so let's, um, pram is, uh, let's say, what's it called, ram, pca, but do pca of the, uh, of the image, so it was an image. So what we showed in the uh, earlier was a scores plot where we got x against y, and we put the scores for each x, each pix, each spectrum as a point. Well, we have a problem now because we've got six. Uh, actually, this is quite small. This uh, spectrum is 
Um, how many pixels are there? None pixels should be yeah, none pixels. So there are 890 pixels, but so you don't want to necessarily put 890 points. The infrared one is. Um, I'll, we'll do the infrared one in a moment. Uh, so what we what we do is we don't we can plot the loadings. Um, so let's plot the I don't know, second principal component loadings. Oh, I'll show you the I'll show you the RAM. Uh, so we want image let's say image PC two image PC. Well, it's actually pretty lousy image. PC2 image is pretty lousy. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the loading on PC2. So the colors match. Um, uh, principal component to positive contribution of principal component to negative contribution of principal component to. Uh, obviously, that's, that spectrum was nearly all noise because it, uh, it only had a, the cell was in one, one corner. I must message the self, get better demo data. <laughs> so it's not that the data was bad. It's just I like, picked a bad example. <laughs> And this is uh, this is the score plot. So this is the, um, the positive and negative contribution at each pixel relating to um, principal component two. Uh, maybe PC one might be one better. Oh yeah, PC one. PC one's better. And um, and I guess if we uh, plot uh, plot things for PC one. We can see that we've got um, we've got something that's a bit more a bit more meaningful. Uh, so that's principal components, and, and you get the other principal components analysis um, information. So PRAM is a uh, is an image PCA model. It has scores information, loading, so there's a percentage explained variance, uh, and other things. So we can ask for the percentage explained variance. It, of course, the plot. Um, as I says, plot the explained variance. So this is the scree plot that I was talking about. How it's difficult to work out where scree plot should end, and uh, we can plot the cumulative um, version of that. And there's a cumulative version. So actually, three principal components explains 96% of the variance for this particular sample. Um, and that's probably because most of it was noise because it was substrate. So, so, so we can get that information very quickly, and it's all captured in, it's encapsulated inside these objects. So we had uh, images, we have our image models. Let me go back to it. So we had a, um, a our baseline model. We can, we can capture the model. Um, Recall, this is our model, and um, and now we have that information. No, we don't because it didn't do anything. Ha, ha, ha. Um, calculate, is it? Um, I don't know what the command is now. Run model. Just remodel it. Remodel it, we subtract it. And we get our result. And we've got our uh, and we've got our model, which is um, which is a version of the image. And the model is the model is captured inside the image. So our baseline has information in it now where the baseline is gone. Our baseline is a type of um, does it say what it is? It is of type. It's a it's a chi asymmetric baseline model, which has parameters. So we can record those, and then we can feed those in to repeat that model. So we we've got some reproducibility um, built in there. What else? How have we got that? You might be interested in. Oh, so getting your data in. So we, uh, what we did there was we just ran chi file, and we said uh, throw up a dialog box, go find a file, come back. Uh, and that's that, so that's a, that's a bit of a pain uh, to do every time if you can't batch it. In our in our data, we had um, we, we captured the file name somewhere. File names, there we go. So we opened a file from disk, so we captured the file name, and you can open more than one file. So 
Uh, um, not all, not all of these uh, file formats would allow you to open multiple files, and that there's, there's, that's for logistical reasons, because, for example, a Renishaw image file, so a Renishaw file, can contain a single spectrum, many spectra, or an image. And you, I don't know until I open the file, so I don't know what it is. So if I say open six, these six files, some of them might be spectra, some might be collections of spectra, some might be images. And what do you do about that? So, um, so some things I've just blocked because it's just easier, and other things um, it, it's it's a good idea. So let's uh, let's uh, let's have an example of some a different technique because <coughs> I happen to know this. I've got the data here. So here's a bunch of. Uh, a bunch of MASPEC data from uh, imaging MASPEC. Um, from these are for bacteria. Um, let's just open those. And that's now gone. I'm taking those and opened all of them. And, uh, and, and there we have the results. And we've got all of those overlaid. So this is a spectral collection. Um, it's just a bunch of a bunch of spectra. And now when you open a files like that, where you say, I want to open a bunch of spectra, or if you take some individual spectra and you want to say, I want to append, so you, you create a collection and append spectra, that might come from um, from things that you've taken from an image or, or uh, a collection that you've drawn from somewhere else. Um, it will interpolate, interpolate the data. So it, it takes the best, the most the common match if you're uh, wave number or wavelength uh, chemical shift is, is different. It takes the, the common overlap and then it looks at the point spacing and will will match the point spacing so that you can create a matrix. So it means that uh, the result of a um, of a spectrum collection that you've loaded or appended might not have the same limits. It's got the, the limits of maximum overlap in the data that you've put in and that's kind of a design decision, because otherwise it gets ragged at the edges. And also you need your points to overlap. So if we zoom right in here, um, these points uh, will overlap. So of course you can't see very well, but these are all lined up, which they are actually are not in imaging mass spec data. This is, um, so these have been interpolated. Um, This is another mass spec data set. I just happen to have one that I use for demo, so I wrote my own little command for reading it in. One as well. So it's a, an image. So this is a this is a useful one for doing a PCA on um, because you can get uh, you get a better feel for it. PCA, you you have. Things like this, where you're producing something which is not the same as the input. So we're taking an image where we want to produce, produce a principal component model. Then you have to have something equal to something, because otherwise it's, it doesn't make any sense. So this is doing PCA of um, uh, of that image. It takes a moment. Come on. Oh, I should have, uh, I forgot to normalize it. Oh, well, never mind. Normalization, where well, we talk about normalization. So I've got a bunch of different normalizations. Um, vector normalization is one I use most. So every, all the data sets, a spectrum or an image collection, you can do vector normalization. You can also do uh, some normalization if you want to see how to do the total intensity. Uh, you can do feature normalization where you can specify the top of a peak and the bottom of a different peak and uh, normalize that range to one. Uh, you can put a little window around those because maybe you want to be the maximum in a small range around the top of a peak so that you're not influenced by noise or, uh, or slight peak shifts. You put a little window and it takes the maximum in that range for each spectrum. And you, you can also put something like the median across the bottom. So if you're in the noise, you've got the jagged noise and you want something um, there, which will be the median of the noise to act as a, a sensible value at the bottom. So you can get sensible values for the top and the bottom of, of, a, of a, a feature range. So that's under feature normalization. 
and those are parameters you're tunable. Uh, what else have we got that you might need? Oh, oh, so okay, so those were reading in far. You've done show the B, sir. I didn't normalize it, so it's not going to be quite as sexy as usual. But there's the first one, and then uh, your second one is the, be the beads against the background. And then the third one is um, the two different beads. So it's doing some separation, but it's not great. But, you know, it's doing separation. Um, you can do random forest on this. So um, we've got, a, for an image at the moment, I can't. Um, I just haven't written it yet. Spectral collections, you just say spectral collection. We had one, didn't we? There's a spectral collection. Um, we can do uh, any kind of spectral collection. We can do random forest, um, k-means, um, PCA, CVA, P PCCVA, it's called my spectral collection. There's all my windows gone. Yeah, so you can append things to a collection if you want to add things on. You can do adaptive boosting. Uh, area measurements, which are useful if you want to measure there. So there's a, a straight line, baseline um, subtraction over a peak. Denoising, I say you can so you can do the principal components denoising um, of uh, of a collection or an image. Um, uh, well, we've got first derivatives, second derivatives. Uh, we've got mean centering. We can measure areas. Um, we can we can lock up bottom of a spectrum to zero intensity because otherwise your vector normalization gets screwed up. Um, uh, plot things are uh, random forest here, so you've got random forest built in. Um, and uh, second row of smoothing. Um, this is uh, Savitigole smoothing. Uh, the first and second derivative of Savitigole, and the smoothing is also Savitigole. Um, so just some on various parameters. There are partially squares if you have a collection, and then you give um, the uh, you can specify your independent variable as a as a, as a set of values, and it will do a, a fit and prediction for that as well. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, yes, yeah, so if, if you so we've got uh, metadata. So in our data, and uh, I got an example of our data. So our UTR. So this is just a shortcut to loading the data that we have. Actually, let's just clear everything out. Uh, let's clear out everything. To do right, go on, right. Get rid of that. So, um, so this is the data that we had uh, in the uh, the talk earlier. It's a it's a spy uh, chi infrared spectral collection. And uh, and all we did before what we did with that. So that that is UTI. So I asked it to uh, vector normalize itself. Which it did so it just vector normalized itself. Um, let, I'll show you what it looks like. This is the vector normalized data. I'll, actually, I'll show you. I'll, let's load it back in again, and then you can see. You can see both. So this is the the unnormalized data. It's a bit all over the place, and uh, then uh, let's store the vector normalized data. Oops. And you can see them uh, side by side. So you can see um, the, the the raw data and the vector normalized data. So that's very good. So we did that, and then um, and then we did PCA of the vector normalized data. So um, VN here, VA, <laughs> PCA, and there's our model that we we calculated for that data set. And, and then we did uh, plot uh, plot scores. I think we did. And there's there's the score plot. So that's that went straight into the presentation. So it's, it was quick and quick and easy to uh, to generate uh, that sort of plot. Um, let, let's do the holdout version. Um, Oh no! I need I need to plus. Now then, important thing: um, this spectral collection, because of the way I've read it in, I've got class membership. I know which spectrum is which. 
Uh, it also allows me to do things like um, what was the UTR is well, well, a vector normal. Vector norm. I can I can plot it, which gives me the spectra, which is what it does by default if you just say what the variable is. But I can also plot it with um, the mean of the data. Oops. That is just the mean of the data. Uh, I can plot it mean grouped. And that is now the mean of each of the classes of the data. And if you want to, you can also, and you can do median, and you can also plot standard deviation of the group of the data. Now it gets a bit, I gets a bit busy for this sort of uh, this sort of data, but uh, you kind of get the you get the idea. So this is the uh, the the, the uh, standard deviation um, with the mean in the center. So that gives you an idea of the spread of the data. I can do that group because I have class membership. So class membership is labels and classes. So each uh, one of these has a label. Uh, each, each spectrum has a label. Uh, I have the unique labels. I have um, how many unique labels there are. Each one labeled as one, two, three, four, five. How many of each of them there are, all that sort of information. Now, how do you generate that? OK, so we've got different methods of generating that. So um, our classes could be, you can create a cli cli class membership, there we are. You give it a name. Then you, there are different ways of generating them. So you can have, for example, um, or whatever, something like that. I think I have to put them in. I think I have to create this vector. I can't remember, actually, to be honest. I don't, I never do it. Yeah, so that said, there were four classes and there were seven entries and it's broken down and there are labels for each of those. You can use words for that. You can do something else. So you could say um, uh, something like, so let's say, cancer. And say you've got uh, 100 of those and say you've got uh, non-cancer. And maybe you've got uh, 30 of those. That creates your labels. So then we can attach the labels. So what we do is we say uh, our data, this is UTI, class membership, um, equals this class membership variable. And that then um, it, it attaches that. So we can easily create label systems or multiple, more than one label system for a class of data. For example, for PCA, you might want to, or your data, you might want to label it on um, what you thought it was, cancer, non-cancer maybe on the day of analysis, maybe on the operator, maybe on some other parameters. There are many parameters that you might want to collect for a given set of data. And you might want to view or uh, either create a model, create a, um, a validation model based on those different parameters. So you model it against which day the data was acquired rather than which species it was or which uh, clinical type. Um, so that there are possibly more than one way you want to model data. So there's a way of capturing that. There's a way of easy way of loading this, which is um, in, um, he says, easy way of doing it. Where has it gone? In, in Excel. So what I've done is I created a, what's called a metadata record sheet in Excel. So this is a specific layout that my code can read. So what you do is you put your file names in here. You put, you put your, the location of the file, the files. You put your file names. You can ignore this. Uh, this column doesn't have anything in it. And then we put parameters. So we would have something which is, no, oh, come in. Right. Let me get some examples off. Oh, some of the wrong, wrong line, actually. Uh, so this is an example. So we've got where the data is, what the file names are, something that's, anything that's maybe true or false. Anything that's a numerical quantity that you might want to consider doing um, PLS on, for example, it's numeric one. It's not sample one, sample two, because you can't multiply those by three. You don't get sample six. Yeah. So these are num numerical things like um, time, concentration, that sort of thing, and then some sort of category, categorical um, data. Do I have an example of that? Or is that actually just now? It's just the same thing as what I do. Um, Here's, here's one for the UTI data. I haven't bothered with the file names because I was reading them. I wasn't actually reading the files. I was reading 
Roy's mat file. So I just created a list of the bacteria and what categories they were. And then you can um, you can attach that. In fact, that's what this load. Um, oh that's what the load UTI does. It means it, it uh, loads the data. This is the manual way of creating an infrared collection. You put the wave numbers in, you put the spectra in. It's infrared, which means that you don't need to save wave numbers and uh, absorbance. It will do that for you, but you can change it if you want. Uh, and then you can attach a class membership. And, uh, and that has uh, all of a sudden you've labeled it. You can label multiple class memberships now. So if we had more than one, which of course that data doesn't happen, I should find a good example. You can spit, say, um, I don't think I've got a good example on this computer, they're all at work. You can specify different columns. So you could attach the class membership related to uh, whether, whether it was cancer or not. And you can specify whether it was control or not, or whether it was something else or not. And each of those um, becomes the label that the data are plotted with or the data are classified against. And you can pass, if you have file names, you can pass the metadata sheet to Chi file and it will look for the file names and it will load the file names for you automatically, which means that if you want, you can build this metadata sheet, which acts as a record, permanent record of, of the information about your data, which is a good thing to have. And when you submit your paper, you submit your data uh, to a repository, like the ClearSpec Zenodo repository. And then you can also submit your metadata file, which gives a description of what each spectrum was, rather than spectrum one, spectrum two. It's cancer, um, analyzed on day two, uh, analyst, um, someone, various parameters about that, doing drug treated cells or something, what the time, time for each time course was. And you have a separate row for each spectrum and lots and lots of these columns, which either have a true, um, true false category, a numeric category or, uh, or a category category label. And it will pick those up and it will manage that information for you. And it will generate your plots for you. It will generate the labeling on your, um, uh, on your classes. And when we went to, um, because I had that information, when I did the, uh, the CVA, am I, uh, so look, let's vector normalize data and we'll do PC CVA. On that, do I need more information? I don't think I do. There's the canonical variates and um, we want to plot, we can plot the principal components aspect of the canonical variates or we can plot the canonical variates aspect of the canonical variates. And we get our, our CVA plot and, and because the class membership was attached, it has used the class membership in the stratification and it has used the class membership um, uh, as, as part of the drawing, a part of the, um, of the data. Uh, just something to point out here, this is a, a, a five class model. If it's a two class model, uh, there's only one way of separating two classes. So you only get one canonical variant and therefore what we, we don't get a scatter plot, we get a, a, a box plot and it will create the box plot for you automatically. And uh, of course I don't have an example of that because hey, why would I have an example of that? Um, I'm sure I did one yesterday, which must be buried in amongst my command history somewhere. Um, but I don't know where it would be. Hold out tests. Don't know. Can't remember. But it would produce a, a, a box plot for you because a box plot is the most appropriate thing for two, two classes. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, masks. So you can you can annotate images. So uh, we had an image, didn't we? I deleted the image, okay. Um, let's get our beads, our beads data back up again. Um, we can annotate uh, that. 
somehow, if I can remember how to do it. Stop that. Uh, how do I do the beads again? Can't remember. So many commands and can't remember. I can't even remember how my own code works. This is a mass spec image. The data, in, the data in images is stored as rows of data, not a three-dimensional cube. You can export the, the cube as saying, please export as a hypercube. Um, but uh, for simplicity, it's just kept as, a, as an unfolded array. I, oh, there we are, ROI. So we've got a region of interest, freehand or polygons or rectangles, because that's kind of built into my lab, so it's kind of handy. Um, so that's so a, rect, a rectangle. Let's put that somewhere. Um, so we can we can draw a box on there, and that um, has now extracted that uh, that information, and and then we can export that. As you could just say to a collection, and then we can take that and, and use that directly in a um, in a classification experiment. And we have a, a freehand um, version as well, of course. Um, and if we, oh, which, oh, this was the last window. Use the last window opens. Use this one. So, oh, actually, let's, let's have that one instead. So uh, there we go, I just annotated that region. Because that's not rectilinear, it, um, we're gonna finish there. I think I've got it. Oh, yeah, I did that already. Of course, I went over the, over the substrates, there's nothing there, which is not a very good example. But th that is the, um, those are the spectra from each of the pixels inside this region. And then we can apply that directly to a classification experiment. So um, I think that's um, pretty much all I really want to say about that. If you've got any questions about this, get in touch with me. That's fine. You can put questions on the ClearSpec Data uh, Slack channel. That's fine. It's a good place to put things so other people can benefit from that. If you find bugs, tell me about it. We can put, um, there are, uh, there's a, uh, an issues thing. I'll put some issues in here. I've put loads of issues in here, actually, because I'm sold any of them. Um, you have to, if you want to report an issue, you have to join Bitbucket, but I say it's free. It's fine. It's anonymous. You can put some other fake name in, uh, some things that need fixed. Uh, or you can get in touch with me directly, or you can um, put a message on uh, ClearSpec Data. So any bugs are worth knowing about. If you want to get involved, that's great. I'm happy to have other people work on this. Yeah, so, um, that's, that's fine. And uh, hopefully you'll have some benefit from it. So I, think I should probably draw a line there, because otherwise uh, one of the cashiers is going to come and get me. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for great tutorials. I'm sure we all will benefit uh, from this. And uh, because it's almost 1 p.m. in Poland, uh, we need to start the next session. So thanks a lot once again. And Kasia Marzec, uh, Professor Katarzyna Marzec from the Center of Experience.